But CRT says that your identity, your guilt, and even your innocence is based on your group, not your individual status as an image bearer. So if you're white, by their definition, you are an oppressor, period. If there is no objective truth, well, there is no morality. There's no absolute right or wrong. If there is no right or wrong, why would oppression be bad? We are a biblical authority ministry, equipping Christians with answers. Why? To defend their faith, to proclaim the gospel effectively. That is our heartbeat. And so the heartbeat behind the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, and all that we do is not simply to win a debate about any given issue, whether CRT or the age of the earth, but rather defending biblical authority to proclaim the gospel effectively and be the salt and light that God has called us to be. And that is our passion. And one of the core principles I'm sure you've heard already that we talk about as a ministry is that ultimately all the issues that we talk about, whether social issues or science issues, it's ultimately truly a worldview issue. And foundationally, there are only two worldviews. There are only two religions. You see, either God's word is your authority, and you build your worldview and your thinking from that foundation, or reject God's word, and what are you left with? Man's word, man's ideas to build your worldview from. And so either God's word is your authority, or man's word is. And guys, it's not too much to say that on every single issue, it always comes down to this. Either God's word is your authority, or man's is. There is no neutrality. You put your faith in one or the other. But there is no neutral. The Bible says the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God. The friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Jesus said either you're with me or against me. Either you gather with me or you scatter. There is no such thing as neutrality. And bottom line, you put your faith in one foundation or the other. Both views are religious. Both sides have faith. The question is where do you put your faith? And you got two options either God's word or man's. So recognizing that as Christians, we should boldly stand on God's word, hold fast to God's word, use it to refute those who contradict, to exhort those in truth. And we do all this in a loving way, not quarrelsome, but we are kind, we're patient, we're gentle. Why? Because we want to see people get saved. Amen? Amen. Not about winning an argument, about winning souls by the power of God for the glory of God. And so that is our passion as a ministry. And that's a passion behind this talk entitled Woke Injustice. A biblical response to critical race theory. Now, we're going to cover a whole lot of information over the next three hours. <laughs> all right, okay, we'll try to squeeze this into an hour, all right? Maybe a little bit over, but uh, we'll cover a lot, but don't worry. It's all written down for you in a book entitled Woke Injustice, all right? And so actually, I made this talk first, and this became a book straight from the talk. And so if you want these notes in detail later on, it's all in the book. And so I will go fast, and we'll cover a whole lot. It is a biblical response to critical race theory. And as I was doing research on this topic, I found this picture that I thought was pretty appropriate for the world we live in today. How CRT is really creeping in, not only into schools, but into our culture at large, but also how it's creeping into the church. And that's going to be really one of our main focuses during our time together right now. How this ideology is really getting into um, the body of Christ, and that's why we care. And ultimately, as we'll see, I'll flesh this out as we go, CRT, what it does, it undermines biblical authority, the sufficiency of Scripture. It undermines biblical anthropology, how we view people. It undermines gospel sufficiency. And so we're going to flesh this out, but this, why, this is why this issue matters so much. Those are the core things at stake. Got to keep that in mind. And it is very true that CRT is literally everywhere in our culture. It goes by different names, which you'll see it pop up in so many different ways. I can show you thousands of headlines. You know they are there. They're literally everywhere. The question is, though, what is critical race theory? Good question. Glad you asked. Here's the definition, a short one. It is a worldview that assumes a society is made up of the oppressors and the oppressed, according to race, based on critical race theory. It assumes the oppressors have structured society to benefit themselves, to suppress the oppressed, and is thus systemically racist. I want you to note it is a worldview that assumes these things, does not try to prove them. The UCLA Luskin Public School of Affairs, one of the primary definers of CRT, said this, CRT recognizes, that is, it assumes, that racism is ingrained in the fabric and system of the American society. This is the analytical lens Another word for worldview that CRT uses in examining existing power structures. And so I want you to understand that as we look at critical race theory, here is what it is not. It is not a helpful analytical tool. 
It is not. And it's, it's an entire worldview. It's not meant to be proven. It is assumed to be true. It's a lens through which you look at everything and understand the world through. It therefore defines reality. It is an entire worldview. You've got to keep that thought in mind. So where did it come from? Well, it comes from Marx's conflict theory. It's just a new version of an old idea. It's a new version of Marxism. You might call it neo-Marxism or cultural Marxism. But Marx had the idea that you have the haves and the have-nots, basically economic problems. You have the oppressors and the oppressed, and the oppressed needed to rise up and take back what was rightfully theirs to achieve equality and freedom in a culture to reach some sort of Marxist utopia. But of course, when the Marxist revolution did not accomplish the toppling of capitalism like they thought it would, the Marxists thought, Marxists went back to the drawing board. They began to say, what went wrong? Why didn't the revolution happen the way we thought it would? Along comes, in the early 1900s, an Italian Marxist named Antonio Gramsci. And he adds to the equation something called hegemony. He said, this is why the revolution never really took place the way we thought it would. So what is hegemony? Well, it's the idea that society's ruling group has structured society to benefit themselves and to oppress others. And that people simply just grow up with these rules set in place by the oppressors. Therefore, oppression is normalized. The oppressed don't even know they're oppressed. That's why they never fought back. That's why the revolution never actually took place. The oppression has been normalized and it is culture-wide. Not just an economic group, but in the uh, structures of society. That's literally systemic. It's literally everywhere. And this sounds just a little bit nebulous. I'll give you an example from my son Ian, who is now 10 and about to be 11. And my son, especially when he was younger, loved to make his own games up. And he wanted all of the family to come play Ian's games. And when we played Ian's games, guess who always won? Ian. Every single time. Why? Because he made the rules of the game. So is that he always won. This is the idea of hegemony. And taking the analogy just one step further, what if Ian teaches his younger sister Macy his games with his rules? And that's all she knows. And all she ever experiences is that he always wins. Well, she'll assume that's just normal, so she'll have no reason to fight against it. The oppression has been normalized. This is the idea of hegemony. And so they would say they apply it to the culture. And then, long story made really short, just for the sake of time, you have the Frankfurt School, which is a group of uh, famous Marxists out of Frankfurt, Germany. They kind of fine-tune all these ideas. They apply it to all of society. They call it critical theory. And this basically says that society is made up of the oppressors and the oppressed. Oppression is systemic. And it's all about the quest for equity in a society, not equality. We'll get back to that one later on. And then what the critical theorist does is they place in the middle of these two words what they think is the primary oppressive problem in a culture. So you have things like critical race theory, critical class theory, critical gender theory, so forth and so on, critical legal theory. That's what you get. But in short, just for the sake of time, CRT is a new neo-Marxist ideology. It's a new version of an old idea rooted in pagan ideology, rooted in religion of humanism, and it is anti-biblical to the core. Actually, CRT says Christianity is part of the oppression in a culture, in our culture today. These things are not compatible, not even close. Two different worldviews. And so I told you we're going to fly through a bunch of stuff, but let me give you kind of a big picture perspective. Let me give you what I call like the eight core principles of CRT. All right. Now you can try to write these down. If you can keep up with me and write all this down, that's impressive. All right. We're going to fly, but we can get the notes to you later on if you need to in some way, either by the book or maybe by notes I can make later on. But here are the eight core principles. There could be more of these, and you could expand these into a whole different sections, but this is just a quick overview. So, it says that people are identified by groups, that's important, according to race, ethnicity, religion, sexuality, etc., stuff like that. You're either an oppressor or the oppressed based on these different features, whatever they may be, skin shade, sexuality, so forth and so on. But you're either an oppressor or the oppressed, period. You fall in those two groups. Secondly, intersectionality is a tool used to determine someone's group and their level of oppression. And we'll come back to intersectionality later on in the talk. And then according to CRT, oppression is the only real sin. Only the oppressors are guilty, and it is systemically present. So only one group is guilty within CRT. The other group is innocent by definition. It says any disparity in outcome between the oppressor and the oppressed groups is the result of oppression, discrimination, and racism, period. Outcome, outcomes must be equal. If they're not, it's discrimination, period. No other option is allowed. It says that the oppressed have an understanding of reality through their oppression that the oppressors can't have. Therefore, their voices should be culturally authoritative. And also, any who disagree with CRT are just trying to maintain their oppressive power. 
to either agree and they're right or disagree and it shows they're right. They're right either way you look at it in their worldview, because it is a worldview. And then their goal is a redistribution. It's Marxism, therefore a form of socialism, of power, privilege, and authority and resources to the oppressed. And how do you do this? Well, the solution is a revolution, the deconstruction of a systemically oppressive society so you can rebuild it, so you can build back better, if you will, or to build back Marxists. And so it doesn't want to reform, it doesn't want to kind of modify existing structures. No, you gotta tear it down, it's, it's just too far gone. You gotta tear it down to build it back within a Marxist ideology to accomplish their utopia. And so they don't want to, they want to reform the police, they want to defund the police and abolish the police. Kind of see that ideology coming through. And please understand, all of these things are simply meant to be assumed. And it's all based on man's word, rooted in a pagan religion, a pagan ideology. And you can notice even at a glance, guys, these things aren't even close to biblical. Like, it's not even close. And we need to be sure as Christians that we are not being taken captive by Holland and set to philosophies that depend on human tradition rather than on Christ. So, all that being said, that's kind of your brief introduction. We're going to fly, I told you. What does CRT look like in America today? How do you define this? And what we're going to look at is, guys, we're going to look at some of the very popular words and definitions they use, and they change words all the time. So you'll see how these ideas are kind of being smuggled into the church, into our culture at large. And so we'll use some of those key words to really define those for us. And also, please note, I'm going to show you how this thinking is infiltrating the church. So I will quote and show many video clips of many Christian leaders, some of whom are very popular. And so as I show these clips, please understand, I am not trying to attack them. I'm attacking a compromised worldview, that actually a compromised ideology that undermines biblical authority and actual unity and racial reconciliation. We're attacking a bad idea that's creeping into the church. That's what we are attacking. So kind of please that thought, keep that thought in mind. But here's what CRT looks like in the American context. It says, all whites are the oppressors. So if you're white, by their definition, you are an oppressor, period. Doesn't matter about your background, your history, where you come from. Doesn't matter if you just moved from Russia yesterday. If you're white and you're here, you're an oppressor, period. Whites, back in the day, have engineered society to benefit themselves. Therefore, they always win, like in with the game. They've created the hegemony. That's why they always <coughs> succeed in society, because they are the oppressors and set the rules. And then, by definition, blacks especially, but other minorities also are the oppressed in our culture today. And a quick little side note, here's the deal. I'll be using the terms whites and blacks throughout the talk, just simply for ease and speed to communicate what CRT actually teaches. And we understand biblically, how many races are there? That's just one, the human race. Also, how many colors of skin are there? Actually, just one, brown. Different shades of brown, mostly based on a pigment called melanin from light to dark, but just one color of skin. So one race, one color. But I'll use the terms blacks and whites to just communicate what CRT is trying to really infiltrate into our culture today. But the Bible also says that in, we as people, we are individuals equal in value. Are we diverse? Absolutely. But equal in value because we're made in God's image. And so we're also individually accountable to God for our own sins as individuals. Equal in value as individuals, equally accountable. But CRT says that your identity, your guilt, and even your innocence is based on your group, not your individual status as an image bearer. So it's in direct contradiction to the Bible right off the bat. So how is this expressed in our culture today? Well, at least our first CRT buzzword, which is whiteness. Yay! So what is whiteness? Well, according to CRT, whiteness is an ideology of assumed superiority created by whites in order to oppress non-whites back in the day. And this is how whites, uh, they use this ideology to justify the oppression, to create the hegemony, therefore they always win. This is the idea. Therefore, anything part of white culture is part of systemic oppression, is racist, and is therefore bad. And so uh, the idea of whiteness is not thought to be a biological fact, but a social fact. People embrace it as a social fact, therefore, to impose the oppression in a culture. As the term implies, it's only connected to white people. And so anything part of white culture is part of the oppression. This is why Coca-Cola told its employees not that long ago that you should be less white in their anti-racist training. Why? Because to be white is to be oppressive, to be arrogant, to be defensive, and to be ignorant. Because whiteness is bad and part of the oppression. That's why the National Museum of African American History and Culture had a warning 
Watch out for the signs of whiteness in our culture, which are signs of oppression. And what are, what are some of these signs of whiteness and oppression? Well, individualism, independency, the nuclear family, objective thinking, hard work. Why? Because it's kind of born out of the Christian worldview, the white worldview, if you will, that becomes part of the systemic oppression in a culture. And again, CRT says Christianity is part of the main oppressive apparatus in our culture. Therefore, thinks it is bad and wrong, must be overthrown. It's being taught not only at the higher academic levels, but also in lower levels in the education. For example, here's a book called Not My Idea, a book about whiteness. You used to teach primary elementary school kids in at least 25 different public school districts in 12 different states. Inside talks about whiteness, how whiteness is a bad deal and that it's actually a deal with the devil. So here's a contract for whiteness. And also, please note, if you have white skin, you are automatically signed up to this contract. And somebody got to take your name off of there. If you have white skin and you're a white kid in that class, you have signed a deal with the devil because you are white. And if you are agree to whiteness, you get stolen land and stolen riches. You get to bully all the other people. You, you get to be the oppressor. And you get all these negative attributes attributed to you. Why? Because of the color of your skin. There's a word for that. It's called racism. CRT is utterly a racist ideology to its core. My original title for this talk was When Racism Becomes Justice. Woken Justice works well, too. It's a shorter title for the book. But this is racism called justice. And racism is evil any time in any form towards anyone. But this is a racist ideology. But this ideology is creeping into the church. I'll give you one example. For now, Jarvis Williams. He's a professor of New Testament interpretation at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, a very conservative seminary. You may know that for many different reasons. But here he's talking about whiteness. He defines it according to CRT terms and embraces it as an actual fact. Listen to what he says here. So then the question is, what is whiteness? Well, here's something that's very important to realize. Whiteness is not about your biology. It's about an ideology. It's a biological fiction, but a social fact. So one aspect of whiteness was a way for Europeans who were different to homogenize themselves into a group known as white to distinguish themselves from these enslaved Africans one reason we get slavery is because of the construct of whiteness. One reason, right? Of right. course, slavery is complicated. So now, according to him, whiteness is a social fact, like CRT says. And that one reason we get slavery is because of whiteness. And if you listen to him talk further, I would argue he would say it's the primary reason that we get slavery is because of whiteness, which belongs connected only to white people. But guys, the Bible is clear that we are all our sinners. Our sinners. Evil is not limited to one particular skin shade, light or dark brown. We're all sinners by definition. And we get slavery. Why? Because of sin, not skin. This is why you see slavery throughout human history way before the idea of whiteness was ever invented. It's literally everywhere. But these ideas are utterly anti-biblical and could not be more anti-Christian. But that leads into the next uh, CRT catchphrase, which would be something called white privilege. And if you're white, this is something you have, whether you like it or not. Come straight out of whiteness. So what is white privilege? What is unearned advantages possessed by whites in a society created by and for whites? So all the benefits you get for being white in a white-made society, according to them. And whiteness was used to establish and entrench this white privilege to be sure that whites always won. Again, this has created the hegemony. So the system is rigged from the get-go to benefit whites and suppress other people to oppress them. Robin D'Angelo, a main mover and shaker in CRT circles, wrote the book White Fragility, come back to her later on. She said this, whiteness studies, by the way, that's a thing. Whiteness studies in many universities begin with the premise that racism and white privilege exist in both traditional and modern forms. And rather than work to prove its existence, work to what? Reveal it. You don't prove it. It's assumed to be true. Why? Because it's an assumed conspiratorial worldview. It is unfalsifiable. Uh, who invented the term? Well, Peggy McIntosh is an American feminist CRT activist. She invented the term white privilege. And basically she said, it's an invisible package of unearned assets you get for being white. You're meant to remain oblivious to it as a white person, but it's invisible. It gives you all these special provisions and maps and codes and so forth to do well society and to oppress others. And again, this is assumed, and it's creeping into Christian thought. 
You might know the name Matt Chandler, very famous pastor over in the Texas area. Listen to him define white privilege, and basically it sounds like he's reading straight from the CRT playbook. I have grown up with this invisible kind of bag of privilege, this kind of invisible toolkit that, that I can reach in there at any given moment and, and have um, this type of privilege that a lot of other brothers and sisters don't have, don't possess. And so if I could just kind of lay it all out there, what I'm talking about right now is white privilege. By the way, it's interesting, this video clip is no longer available on his church website. Wonder why that is. And by the way, if you listen to him talk, he does seem genuinely concerned about racial reconciliation. And that can be a good thing. But it's so tragic as well because he's importing ideas that undermine actual unity and actual racial reconciliation into his church. He's what you might call CRT light in so many ways. Guys, we don't need help from a pagan ideology with racial reconciliation. God's word is sufficient for all things, including that particular issue. I'll give you another example of this is creeping into the church. Pastor Tim Keller, before he graduated into glory, also firmly advocated for these particular ideas. Listen to this one quote from him on a panel talking about these particular issues. And he says, if you have the asset of white skin, you have white privilege, basically. Therefore, you got this through injustice and you're a part of the problem. A friend of mine recently, was, uh, who's a pastor, was talking to a Norwegian uh, man who had just moved into his, to his community and went to his church. And at one point he heard... Uh, the pastor talking about the fact that uh, uh, we were we are all complicit in creating this narrative that uh, uh, black people are dangerous, etc. And so we're complicit in this. Afterwards, the white the, the, the Norwegian came up and said, "No, no, no, that's I'm, I'm Norwegian. <laughs> no, I had nothing to do with it." And and <laughs> my uh, and my pastor friend said, uh, "Studies have shown." have pretty much proven that if you have white skin, it's worth a million dollars over a lifetime over somebody who doesn't have white skin. And that's because of historical forces that uh, have come about. And at this point, you know, you, you could go at it several ways. One, as I mentioned, if you have that asset of white skin right now, historical asset, then you actually have to say, I, I didn't deserve this. And also, I'm to some degree, I'm the product of uh, I'm standing on the shoulders of other people who got that through injustice. So uh, the Bible actually says, yes, you do, you do, you are um, involved in injustice. And even if you didn't actually do it, therefore you have a responsibility, not just to say, well, you know, maybe if I get around to it, maybe we could do something about the poor people out there. No, you're, you're part of the problem. You are part of the problem. Why? Because you have white skin. Doesn't matter if your family grew up poor. Doesn't matter if you just moved from Norway last week. Doesn't matter if your ancestors helped to abolish slavery. Now, if you have white skin, you are a part of the problem by definition. Guys, that is so racist to the core and utterly anti-biblical. The Bible says that the soul that sins shall die and that each one dies for their own sin. We don't die for the sins of others nor the sins of our ancestors. We die for our own sin. We have that individual accountability Guys, these ideas are anti-biblical, racist to the core, no matter who has promoted them. By the way, Tim Keller has a huge impact on so many other Christian leaders, even since he's passed away, his writings, his teachings, and so forth. But that leads into the next CRT buzzword, and that's a redefinition of something, and that would be something called white supremacy. So what is white supremacy? Well, it's been redefined. This is not your grandma's white supremacy, right? The KKK or the Nazis or something like that. No, it's been redefined. To something like this. Vody Bauckham defines it well in his book, Fault Lines, a fantastic book, highly recommend it. He defines it this way, any belief, behavior, or system that supports, promotes, or enhances white privilege, that is white supremacy. So whiteness creates white privilege. White privilege leads to systemic oppression, which is basically white supremacy. And white supremacy leads to more white privilege, and the cycle continues, the whites stay in power and oppress all the others. This is the ideology about CRT that's being pushed in our culture today. And please watch this, really important. According to CRT, all whites benefit from the system, directly or indirectly. Thus, you support the system, either directly or indirectly, therefore you're all part of white supremacy. So, if you are white, by CRT definition, you are a white supremacist, an oppressor, and a racist. 
Robin DiAngelo and another CRT author say this in their book, is everyone really equal? When we use the term white supremacy, we are not referring to the extreme hate groups or bad racists. We use the term to capture the all-encompassing dimensions of white privilege, dominance, and the assumed superiority of whiteness in mainstream society. The white supremacy of the soccer moms, of the five-year-old who's in kindergarten, of the preacher, of the construction worker. If you have white skin, no matter your age or where you're at, you are part of the problem, you support the system, you are a white supremacist. Just another name for systemic oppression, really, in a nutshell. And so it's just the water we swim in. And according to CRT, whites fill the tank with the water. Therefore, if you're white, the water's good for you. If you're black, the water's bad for you. And this is why places like Walmart can call their workers racist and somewhat get away with it. And some of their anti-racist training had said to the white employees, you are racist. Why? Because you benefit from a white supremacy system. Note, they get the repugnant title of racist based solely on the shade of their skin. There's a word for that. It's called racism. It's an early racist ideology. And guys, racism is always wrong whenever it occurs to whomever it occurs. And you've got to wonder, whatever happened to Martin Luther and his idea, his dream that he said, I have a dream that someday my four little children will live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. But this has been early rejected by the modern CRT neo-Marxist movement that's infiltrating many Christian circles. I'll give you an example of this. I want to show you a clip of this guy. His name is Matthew Hall. He's the former provost at Southern Bible Theological Seminary. And now he's at Biola, moved on from there. But basically he tells a group here that if you are white, well then you got white supremacy in your background and in the traditions of your faith and practice. That's what he says here. Everything that you assumed or thought was normal in the world, or everything that you thought was true about your tradition, your denomination, uh, your own family, uh, there's a whole, I'm going to pull the veil back and what looked like this beautiful narrative of faithfulness and orthodoxy and truth and righteousness and justice, I'm going to peel that back and I'm going to show you the rotting corpse of white supremacy that's underneath that surface. So if you're white, your faith traditions, that you, you know, your, your orthodoxy you grew up with that you thought was good, that's actually rooted in white supremacy. Why? Because of the shade of your skin. But guys, so calling someone a white supremacist or a racist based solely on the shade of their skin is bearing false witness. It is the sin of slander. As Virgil Walker puts it, he's the director over at G3 Ministries, he says CRT is culturally acceptable racism. I would add this, it's culturally celebrated racism. And by the way, he has a podcast called Just Thinking with uh, Daryl Harrison, which is phenomenal. I highly encourage that one. And so how do critical race theorists get a, around this problem of them being called racist with their ideology? Well, what they do is they redefine racism. Because if racism isn't racist anymore, then you can be racist and not be racist all at the same time. If you redefine racism, and that's what they do. So white supremacy is redefined and racism is redefined. So no longer is racism that old, outdated idea, you know, the actual definition of racism, that says that one group is better than another based on superficial characteristics. You know, like Marx thought, then Hitler thought, and Darwin thought, and they acted accordingly with that ideology. No, that needs to be tossed out the window. There's a new definition that should take over for racism. What is it? Well, they say it's this. It is systemic, there's that word again, institutional, corporate bias that advantages one group, whites in the American context. It is society-wide, and it is always present. It's literally everywhere all the time. It's happening in every interaction and every moment of American history because we are saturated in this systemically oppressive society, according to CRT, literally everywhere. Ibram X. Kendi, who is the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, a CRT rock star, says racism is institutional, structural, and it is systemic. Robin D'Angelo, heard from her earlier, she also says, the question in any given scenario is not did racism take place, but rather how did racism manifest in any given situation? And so, for example, let's say, you know, you have two people walk into a store, a white guy and a black guy walks into the store, and a store clerk walks up to the white person first. Well, if they walk up to the white person first, that's obviously racism because she's actually um, showing special attention to the white person because he's white. So they view that as racism. If the clerk walks up to the black person, black person first, it shows she doesn't trust him because he's black, so she's trying to get his attention, but she doesn't steal anything. Therefore, it's racism again. No matter what the clerk does, it's always racism. Just how did it manifest? It's everywhere all the time. Daryl Harrison puts it like this. Critical race theorists see the entire world through race-colored glasses. They really do. 
literally everywhere, all the time. It is an unfalsifiable, conspiratorial worldview. Utterly arbitrary, built on man's ideas, not God's word. You guys remember the movie, uh, the Lego movie, the song? Everything is awesome, right? And CRT, everything is racist. Like, all the time, every day. That's what they wake up singing. It's kind of weird. But anyway, all right. And I've got a video of Will Ferrell. Anyway, all right. Am I singing that song? That's neither here nor there. And so, again, kind of like with uh, white supremacy, it's the same sort of thing. Since all whites benefit from the system, they are therefore part of the problem. Therefore, they are racist by definition. As you please know, within CRT, you have the oppressors and the oppressed. The oppressors, the whites in this case, cannot help but be evil. Can't help it. It's just who you are. You're just born that way based on the group you're born into. It's born into your identity. You're part of that group. You are part of the problem, period. And someone will say, okay, but then what about the blacks in this scenario? What about them? Well, according to CRT, to be racist, one must have systemic power. Blacks do not, therefore they cannot be racist. So anything they do that seeks to redistribute power from the oppressors to them is totally justified. And oh, by the way, when you remember back in about a year ago when Hamas uh, had that, or Hezbollah had that attack on Israel, right? And they killed uh, over a thousand Jews, massacred them, raped people, burned entire families. And you saw so many people at liberal universities in America celebrating what they did to the Israelites. You know why they celebrated? Because the Palestinians are view viewed as the oppressed and they were actually fighting against their oppressors. Anything they can do to take that power from the oppressor is viewed as right and good. That's their standard for morality. It's all about shifting power from the oppressor to the oppressed. The oppressed cannot be guilty. And by the way, when you bring that into Christianity, what does it say? Well, the oppressed have nothing to repent of. They're all good. They can't be sinful. Why? Because they're oppressed. It's all about power. Utterly anti-biblical. But according to CRT, blacks can't be racist. Just like Disney's The Proud Family is teaching our kids back in 2023. Here's a great synopsis. Model minority myth? What does that mean? I think she just called you a racist, Bunny. Black people can't be racist? I agree. Racism is prejudice plus power. You must have prejudice and power to be racist. And since blacks don't, they cannot be racist according to CRT. Again, it's only connected to white, uh, to white people. Whites are evil, blacks are innocent. By definition, before any actions are looked at, any words are said, any attitude, attitudes are analyzed. Just by definition, based on the color of your skin. I'll say it again. There's a word for that. It's called racism. It's an utterly racist ideology. But again, this is getting into Christian thinking in so many ways. I'm sure you know the name Pastor David Platt in the news for a lot of reasons recently. But uh, he's going to give a definition for racism as he does. Notice the focus on the word system. And for this reason, we must look at the reality of racism. And when I use that term, I'm not just referring to the extremes that we often think of. Extremes that help us, particularly those of us who are white, distance ourselves from racism. When I'm using that term, I'm referring to, so here's the definition I'm using. A system could be individual, could be institutional, could be society, societal, a system in which race, and specifically as we're talking tonight, black or white skin color, profoundly affects people's economic, political, and social experiences. A system in which race is significant enough to be regularly acknowledged and mentioned. A system of thought, practice, that is ever subtly present among us, in me. Notice the focus on system. It's a system, and it's in him. Why? Because he is white and he is part of the problem. But give you another example of this ideology of the redefinition of racism. Here is again Matthew Hall, former provost of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, who tells us this about himself. I am a racist. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if that freaks you out, if, if you think the worst thing somebody can call you is a racist, then you're not thinking biblically. Because mm. guess what? I, I, I am, I'm going to struggle with racism and white supremacy until the day I die and get my glorified body mm. in, a re, in a completely renewed and sanctified mind. Wow. Um, because I'm immersed in a culture where I, I benefit from racism all mm. the time. He's literally ticking all the CRT talking points as he gives a definition. So when he says, I am racist, it doesn't mean he hates people because of their skin shade. 
No, it's because of the shade of his skin and the system he benefits from. That's why he's a racist and he's embracing that idea. By the way, I should say that Matthew Hall is going on later on to recant all that he said here in many other places. Now, we don't know why he did that. I have suspicions about that. So I should say that publicly he said, no, I don't believe this anymore. But for a long time, he very passionately advocated for these ideas in so many different ways. And so, yeah, sin is assigned to you because of your skin. But the Bible says, no, you have sin. Why? Because you are guilty and broken by sin from Genesis chapter 3. CRT says, whites, they're all guilty. They're all racist. It's imputed guilt. You get it just based on the shade of your skin because of the sin of people who looked like you in the past. But the Bible says that it's one sin that comes from the heart that makes you guilty, not your skin. Sin makes you guilty, not your skin shade. And this is true for every descendant of Adam. All our hearts are broken by sin, no matter what your skin shade may look like. But if you don't believe all of this quite yet, well, it's simply time for you to get woke or get canceled in our culture today. And I'll do just a quick summary on this for now. I've got running out of time a little bit. There's a whole chapter of the book on get woke or get canceled. But what does it mean to get woke? Well, basically it means you need to wake up to systemic oppression in our culture. Let the oppressing to wake up to their oppression and to revolt, to achieve equity, have a revolution, rebuild a Marxist utopia. The oppressors, which are the whites in the American context, need to wake up to their illicit gain as the oppressors, give up their privilege, and work without ceasing to redistribute power, wealth, and resources to the oppressed in order to achieve equity, not equality. We'll get into that, I promise. And so according to CRT, it's just everybody needs to wake up to the reality of systemic oppression in our culture today. It's kind of like the movie The Matrix. You guys seen The Matrix? Some of you have? It's like taking the red pill that wakes you up to the hard truth, but once you know it, then you can fight against it. So CRT says you've got to wake up to the reality of systemic oppression. The Bible says we need to wake up to reality that we are all sinners no matter what our skin shade is. We need to turn from our sin and turn to Christ, our only hope of salvation. That's true for every descendant of Adam. That's the real wokeness that we all need, not the CRT version. But according to CRT, the oppressed are wide awake, they are woke, and we need to listen to the oppressed voices as authoritative. So, within CRT, they'll say blacks have an understanding of societal reality through their oppression that whites as oppressors just can't have. And so they understand things better because of the oppression they've been through. And so it's like a form of special knowledge or Gnostic knowledge, basically. And by the way, understand that CRT, they don't think there is an objective truth. It is, it's actually all subjective. It's all based on how you construct uh, your version of that through societal experience. So it's all based on feelings and experience. And so... Here's the deal. If you as a white person try to tell someone, especially a minority, no, truth is not subjective, it is objective, well, that's a white truth, and you're trying to impose a white truth and actually take away their voice, therefore you're being oppressive. All right? But here's my question to the critical race theorists. If there is no objective truth, well, there is no morality. There's no absolute right or wrong. If there is no right or wrong, why would oppression be bad? But that's just logic. Also, another part of the social construct of whiteness in our culture today, and you can't use that unless you use it to refute systemic oppression. Fallacious on so many levels. But from the book Words That Wound, written by a whole host of CRT all-stars, they say this, critical race theory insists on recognition of the experiential knowledge, the lived experience of people of color. This knowledge is gained from critical reflection only, there it is, the lived experience of racism. Your lived experience defines what is true for you. And blacks know reality better because of their oppression, therefore they should be the authority. Phil Vischer, the creator of VeggieTales, who's gone very woke. If you like VeggieTales, I'm sorry, all right? But he's gone very woke. He says, the Bible can tell us what it's like to be black in America, or how to address systemic discrimination in housing or education. We need to listen to voices who study the issues, agree with CRT, and have had the experience. They are the authority. So the blacks are awake to reality, the whites are not. They've not been woken up yet. And according to CRT, blacks will be awake to their oppression in our day and age for a multiple uh, set of reasons, including the oppression they've gone through. But listen to Pastor Eric Mason talk about the blindness of whites and the awakeness of blacks. Where do we find this in the Bible? Ephesians 4, 18. It says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Whiteness has caused blindness of heart. Whiteness has caused blindness of heart. 
the exegesis is stunning. <laughs> but no, whites are blind. Why? Because they are part of the oppressor group and they're blinded by the fact that they're the oppressors. They don't have the experience. Blacks are awake because they've gone through the oppression. They should be the cultural authority. They should be listened to. And here's the deal, according to CRT, all blacks will have the same perspective because they've gone through the common experience of oppression. They'll have the same view. So what happens if a black person does not agree with the CRT oppression narrative in our culture today? Does that disprove CRT then? The answer is no. CRT simply says, well, that black hasn't woken up yet. They've just internalized their oppression. They don't know how oppressed they actually are. So no, no matter what, CRT is true. It's an unfalsifiable conspiratorial worldview. That is all it is. But also, please note, according to CRT, blacks who embrace their oppression, don't realize they're oppressed, they become useful idiots for the oppressors. And so they become part of the problem. And many blacks who buy into CRT view the non-CRT blacks as actually traitors, supporting those who are oppressing the rest of their people. And so they'll call them names like skin folk, but not kin folk. Sell out Negroes, Uncle Toms, Oreos, black on the outside, white on the inside. And they get called all those names. Why? Because they don't agree with the ideology of CRT. How racist can you get? One example of this, you might know the name Larry Elder. He's a very well-known conservative black political commentator. He ran for governor in California back in 2021. And somebody wrote in the Los Angeles Times, Larry Elder is the black face of white supremacy. Why? Because he does not believe in systemic racism. That's why. Inside, the author of the article says this, like a lot of black people, the author's black, though I've learned that it's often best just to ignore people like Elder, people who are, as my dad used to say, skin folk, but not necessarily kin folk. Could not be more discriminatory or racist. I love this quote from Daryl Harrison, pastor, uh, and biblical author and also co-commentator of the podcast, Just Thinking Podcast. He says, CRT is a multi-layer cake with each layer having a different color, but it's frosted in the end with the same flavor of racist icing from top to bottom. I love that visual because it is so true. But according to CRT, whites must listen, learn, and follow as authoritative whatever the blacks say because they know better through their experience. They have a higher level of truth, this Gnostic knowledge. And whites cannot challenge the experiential knowledge of the blacks, of the oppressed. If they do, that's racist. So either you agree that you're racist or disagree and that proves you're racist. And ultimately, according to CRT, the experience of the oppressed determines reality. That determines what is truth. Lived experience becomes a foundation for truth. This is utterly anti-biblical. And friends, as Christians, we should be quick to hear, right? So to speak, slow uh, slow to anger. We should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We definitely should, and we should empathize, no doubt about that. But as we do, hear me, we must be like the Bereans, taking all ideas back to God's Word to see if these things are so. Because bottom line, God's Word is the authority, not man's experience. Man's feelings, man's ideas, man's experience does not determine what is truth. God determines what is truth that is found in His Word. And God's word is sufficient. But if you argue against any of this as a white person, well, that is just your white fragility showing. You say, I don't want white fragility. Well, you've got it if you're white. Congratulations. All right. In case you want to know what that is, I'll let Robin D'Angelo, the author of the idea, explain to us in this quick little video clip. Here she is explaining white fragility. White fragility is the defensiveness, the argumentation, the hurt feelings, the withdrawal that often erupts whenever white people are challenged on their racial worldviews. The fragility part is meant to capture how little it takes to cause white people to erupt in defensiveness. But the impact of that defensiveness, however, is not fragile at all. It functions as a kind of everyday white racial control by making it so difficult for people to challenge us uh, on our unaware assumptions and biases that most of the time they don't. And so it, it functions to keep everybody in their place and protect the racial hierarchy. In my book, I gave an example you probably know someone, you can think about them in your mind right now, someone who if you mention anything to them about being wrong or disagree with them, they just blow up. You know someone like that? They get mad really quickly or get really emotional really quickly. And so what do you do? You just don't engage them because it's too much hassle, it's too much trouble. Just leave them alone. You can be right, just stay, get away from me. 
Same idea here. The emotions, according to them, is the way whites maintain control through this practice of white fragility. So note, any disagreement by whites with CRT claims is just a desire to maintain oppressive power. And so again, as I've said already, either you agree with CRT that you're racist as a white person or disagree for any reason and that proves you're racist. That is logically fallacious. It is a catch-22. It's assuming your conclusion. The conclusion is smuggled into the starting premise. It's like asking the question, have you stopped beating your wife? What's the person going to say? No, that means you still are. Yes, it means you did beat your wife. Either way, what's the assumption? They beat their wife. It's smuggled into the question. Same thing here. These ideas are smuggled into the questions. They're assumed to be true. Why? Because it is a worldview. Hear me, not a helpful analytical tool. Not even close. And the critical race theorists will say, well, just trust us and all this. We know what's best, but God's word says, no, don't trust man's word. Trust my word. Do not lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. But once you've gotten woke and gotten over all your white fragility, well, it's time for you to get to the unending work of something called anti-racism. And man, doesn't that word sound so good? What's the opposite of anti-racism? Pro-racism? Right? So you think this has got to be a good thing. So what is anti-racism? Well, here's the rub. According to CRT, it is actively fighting racism as defined by CRT. That is the key. It's not about you know, fighting against bad attitudes or thoughts or actions towards people because of their skin shade. No, it's about tearing down and replacing systemically oppressive structures in our society. It's tearing down systemically oppressive structures that have taken over, getting rid of the oppression in order to rebuild to achieve equity, equal outcomes. And if you don't want to be racist, according to CRT, this is something you must be doing. By the way, if you're white, you're racist by definition, but if you don't be a really bad racist, then you must be doing this. Even S. Kennedy, in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, which is the textbook of schools, corporations, government agencies to teach this stuff, he says, there is no neutrality in the racism struggle. The opposite of racist isn't not racist, it is anti-racist. You must be working to tear down these oppressive structures in society. If you are not, you're part of the problem. Well, if you're white, you're part of the problem already, but you're just a bigger problem. And again, this is getting into the thinking of many Christians. Jamar Tisby, the author of The Color of Compromise, talking to Phil Vischer, talking about this very issue. Listen to what he says. That black people and people of color have not been given are, are due in terms of equity, in terms of distribution of resources, in terms of opportunity. And it speaks to uh, the idea that we have to be intentional and be actively working to ensure equity and justice. We can't simply, I, I say this in the book, um, you are either actively working against racism or you are supporting racism, whether actively or passively. Uh, there's no in between. There is no in between. Either you agree or you're part of the problem. And what's the goal of all this work of anti-racism? Well, you're working to redistribute wealth, power, privilege, and opportunities to the oppressed. So you gotta shift power from the oppressors to the oppressed. And when you do that, that is social justice. That is the act in their thinking. And this is where the, uh, the acronym diversity, equity, inclusion really comes in. Really, DEI is just CRT, with just different letters. All right? But you must include diverse groups to achieve equity. Who are the diverse groups? Anyone other than the oppressors. You must include these minority groups. You must shift power over to them. And so what this means is you could get a job or not get a job, get a scholarship or not get a scholarship based solely on the shade of your skin. There's a word for that. It's called racism, racism to the core. A few examples of this. It's kind of a funny one here, kind of sad, but Chicago Art Institute fired its roughly 100 volunteer museum guides. Why? Because they're mostly wealthy white women. Got to get rid of them because they're part of the oppressor class. Must so open this up to opportunities for the oppressed. Well, this professor over at Washington and Lee University said this that vote, uh, black votes in America should count twice. This is a part of shifting power back to the oppressed. He calls it vote reparations to get rid of systemic racism and oppression. Or there are many colleges and universities who have actually created what's called affinity spaces where they're encouraging their students and their staff on their school grounds to separate into segregated race-based groups. 
This is a policy the KKK could really get behind. It's a horrible racist ideology. But Ibram S. Kennedy said this in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. The only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The so guys, discrimination and racism is always wrong, anytime, anywhere, against anyone. Guys, all this stuff, honestly, it is a sin of partiality, plain and simple. That's what it is, to its core. And Virgil Walker said it like this, that what they're putting forth is racism to combat so-called racism. It's racism in the name of justice. That's why woke justice is woke injustice. Actually practicing injustice in the name of justice. And please note... The penance of all whites for the sin of racism is to always do the work of anti-racism. You must always do it. You cannot stop because you are part of the problem. It does not matter about your background, your history, what you've done, your attitudes towards other people, your thoughts, your beliefs. None of that matters. All that matters is the shade of your skin. You are part of the problem. Again, this is guilt by association, generational guilt. Latasha Morrison, the author of the curriculum used in churches called Be the Bridge, supposedly dealing with racial reconciliation, she said you'll need to examine your own life and the lives of your ancestors to see whether you've participated or benefited from systems of racism. And if you're white, you have, therefore you're part of the problem. But again, this is generational guilt. It is unbiblical all the way down. Matthew 16, we are condemned for our own sins, not the sins of our Father. But this is CRT's version of justice, and that's why it is injustice. And please note, as a white person, there is no end, there is no atonement, there is no forgiveness. You have an incurable disease you cannot get rid of. It's like being on a treadmill that you cannot get off of. And I don't know about you, but I hate treadmills. Anybody else? All right. But if you're white, you've got debt you can never pay off. You can pay the interest on the debt. That's what anti-racism is, paying the interest, but the debt will always remain. And as soon as you stop working the way you think you, they think you should, then your debt is called. You're forfeited on. You're canceled in our culture. And guys, when you bring this sort of ideology into the church and try to Christianize it, here's what it basically does. It says the gospel is not enough. That if you want racial reconciliation, and some even argue salvation, then you must add works to the equation as a white person. CRT says, we bring it into the church, that when Christ on the cross said it is finished, he was wrong. It's not finished, at least not for whites. There's more work they must do. That Christ's blood is enough to cover all your sins and to make you a new creation. This is anti-biblical, anti-gospel to the core. It's not even close. The Bible is clear that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And once you're in Christ, there's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And once you're in Christ, your sins are blotted out, and God remembers them no more. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But friends, CRT and the woke mob always remembers. If you don't do what they want, you are condemned already. What are they trying to achieve with all this work of anti-racism? I've got to go quick here. We'll be 10 minutes over, I'm sure, on this. But they're trying to achieve equity. What is equity? Well, it's not equality. So equality is that all people are viewed equal, should be given equal opportunities to succeed and thrive and flourish. Equity says, no, the outcomes must be the same for everyone, period. Must have equal outcomes. Doesn't matter about how much effort you put forth, your culture, your background, your history, your family background, what you believe, your attitude, none of that matters. Equal outcome, that must be the case. And this is socialism 101. Must have equal outcomes. So equality says, you give them an equal starting line, they'll finish at different places, but equal opportunity. Equity says you must stagger the start to be sure everybody finishes at the same time. That's what equity says. And within CRT thinking, any unequal outcome between groups that's negative towards the oppressed, it's always racism. Every time. Again, doesn't matter about how much work or non-work people do or don't do, how much effort, their attitudes, their thoughts, their cultural background, their history, none of that matters, just the shade of their skin. That's all that matters. And guys, this does not line up with reality nor scripture. When you go throughout the Bible, God is creator. He loves diversity, and he is quite fine with us having more or less of any number of attributes. We're talking about money, ability, talents. He loves diversity. He's fine with that. But CRT says, no, that's all just unjust inequity. And here's the deal. Here's what we need to recognize as Christians. 
God loves diversity, and we're so equal in value, although we're very different. we got short people and tall people in this room, so equal in value because we're all made in God's image. Different abilities, equal in value, made in God's image. And here's what God measures. Like in the parable of the talents, get this, God measures our faithfulness with what He has given us. No matter what the amount is, God measures our faithfulness. That is the focus of God's justice, the main point of this particular parable, if time permitted. But basically, what social justice, critical race theory wants to do is to create unequal scales to be sure we all finish at the same spot. Socialism at its core, it is theft, it is coveting, it is unequal scales, all of which are hated and detested by God. Again, this stuff is not even close to biblical. And guys, here's the deal. In summary, for so many Christians who are trying to in, try import all these ideas as we've seen today, Basically, what they're really saying is this, is that God's word is not enough to deal with racial reconciliation, to deal with these different issues of justice. God's word is not enough. We need outside help is what they're saying. But really, outside help from a pagan, anti-biblical worldview that hates Christianity? We need help from that? No, God's word is sufficient. You guys know 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scriptures breathed out by God are profitable for teaching, or proof, for correction, for training, and what? Righteousness. Justice is a righteousness issue. God's word trains us just for that, that the man of God may be equipped, complete and equipped for how many? Every good work, including the works of justice and righteousness. And then as Christians, what a beautiful thought here. We see in 2 Peter 3, or 1, verses 3 through 4, in Christ we have divine power. We have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. We've become partakers of the divine nature, set free from the bondage of sin. Man, that is good news. What else do we need? The answer is nothing. God's word is sufficient. There's literally no better source. There is no other right source to use to address the issues of reconciliation and justice. God's word is enough. So, all that being said, that applies directly to the issue that's often on the forefront of people's minds today. Well, that being said, are social justice an intersectionality part of the Bible? Are they biblical? The answer is no, 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 and heavens no. <laughs> All right? Why? Well, very quickly, got to go fast because I'm running over time. Sorry about that. I know it would be about 10 minutes over. But what are they? Well, social justice today is just CRT manifest in our culture. That's all it is. And actually, most critical race theorists would admit that. And so for many of them, they call social justice, they call it critical social justice, CSJ, because social justice comes straight out of critical race theory. So they'll call it critical social justice, we'll call it CSJ for short. And so what is social justice all about? Well, watch the words here. The quest for equity, sound familiar, in terms of distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges for groups in a society. I thought the last part didn't have room, but you get the idea. It seeks to identify who? The oppressed. And to right societal wrongs through what? Redistribution of power and resources to the oppressed. And that brings about social justice when you shift power from the oppressor to the oppressed. Guys, this is socialism, Marxism. Calling something justice doesn't make it so. And intersectionality, what is that? Well, basically it is a tool used by the social justice warrior to, deter, to determine someone's oppression, how much they've been oppressed, therefore how much reparation they deserve. It's the idea that there are multiple compounding layers of oppression due to multiple factors like race and gender sexuality that compound and lead to more oppression. And basically the more victim categories you fall into, the heavier your oppression, therefore the greater empowerment and redistribution you deserve. So here's an example. A woman's voice, according to CRT, should carry more weight than a man's in our culture. Why? Because she's experienced oppression as a woman. If she's also African-American, that's another layer of oppression. Therefore, she's even more empowered and more culturally authoritative. If she's also a lesbian, that's another layer of oppression. Therefore, she's even more empowered. If she's also transgender, well, that's another, you get the idea, compounding layers of oppression. Therefore, she's given more cultural authority. And so who's who? Who are the oppressors? Who are the oppressed? Well, there are more categories than this, but here's a short version. The oppressors are going to CRJ, and this is just assumed, by the way, it's part of the worldview. The oppressors are white, males, heterosexual, cisgendered, able-bar, able-bodied, colonialist, Christian. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> I click every single one of those, all right? Who are the oppressed? Well, basically, the opposite of all of those things. And friends, please note, again, Christianity is thought to be part of the apparatus of oppression. 
start to be a major part. And all the Christian ideas of the nuclear family, marriage, biblical sexuality, they're just all part of the oppression. According to CRT, those things must go. These things are not compatible. And please note, critical theory is a very long train. It's pulling along all these other movements as well. And here's what happens for so many Christians. They'll jump on this boxcar because they hear words that resonate with them, words like justice. Words like reconciliation, biblical words that we think we need. Oh, that sounds good, so I need to jump on this. Not realizing it's being pulled by a neo-Marxist ideology. And oh, by the way, when you jump on this boxcar, you're taking along with the entire train, which leads to compounding compromise because these movements have the same ideology. What is the LGBTQ revolution? What is it basically saying? It's saying, well, there are these sexual minorities who are oppressed. And all the regular sexualities... Well, they're part of the oppressor group. And we need to shift power and cultural authority to the oppressed. It's the same ideology driving the LGBTQ revolution. Jump on the boxcar, you get carried along by the entire train. And guys, with those like, secular notions of justice in place, let's quickly say many injustices have occurred in America's history and still occur today. No doubt about that this wor world is an unjust place, right? Because it's filled with unjust sinners like you guys. And me and everybody else because we are broken by sin. And of course, racism is evil every time, anytime, to whomever it occurs. And there are absolute atrocities that have occurred in America's history. No doubt about that. And we talk about those quite often here at the Ministry of Answers and Genesis. We deal with those quite often because many of these racist things come straight out of the evolutionary ideology. Some people are more evolved than others. And there's no doubt these things, slavery, Jim Crow laws, Segregation have multi-generational effects. No same person argues against that. The question is this. Is CRT the answer? Does CRT explain why it happened and how to address it today and in the future? The answer is no. It's an anti-biblical, pagan, neo-Marxist, rooted in man's word worldview. Not a helpful analytical tool. And as Christians, yes, we should care about justice. We should do justice because our God tells us to do justice. We should love justice. We are to show no partiality to the poor or the rich, to the no name or the famous. So yes, we love justice. But here's the key question. Always one of the key questions. Who defines what justice is? And you got two options. Either God does or man does. If man tries, it's utterly arbitrary because it's just their own opinion. And also, with that in mind, who defines what is injustice? And again, either God does or man does. And these two worldviews could not be more different. As you guys already said, only God rightly defines justice both now and forever. And biblically, justice never has an adjective in front of it. There are not variations of justice in God's word. There's just justice and injustice. What things are just? Things in line with God's word, his law, and his nature. What things are unjust? Things not in line with God's word, his law, and his nature. He is the standard found in his word. Guys, critical social justice, critical race theory is just state redistribution through power and politics, shifting power from the oppressors to the oppressed in its own ideology. Biblical justice is about obeying God, our hearts and our attitudes and our actions towards others. Do we obey God? It's a heart, it's actually a heart issue. Do we have obedience to God? That's the focus of biblical justice, law of God and a heart issue. And yes, as Christians, we do seek justice, but we seek justice using biblical definitions, biblical presuppositions, and biblical means. We seek real justice, which requires real truth that comes only from God himself, and we don't seek equal outcomes. We seek righteous obedience, and we trust God with the results. And we do this. We do, it God's, we do God's will God's way. And that's how you do God's will. And what is the heartbeat of God's justice? Here's the heartbeat, that all have sinned, that we are all unjust, that we've all violated God's perfect justice, and we're all accountable to a holy, perfect God, no exceptions. This is God's justice, and this is the Christian's primary concern. When you kind of sum all this up, critical social justice, critical race theory, intersectionality, this whole ideology, it's ambiguous, racist, man-centered ideas built on man's whatever's the authority. They arbitrarily declare who's to blame and who's owed, who's the oppressed, who's the oppressor all based on skin shade. It's a racist ideology. Their message is, I'm owed, I deserve compensation. But God's justice says this, that we are all to blame, no matter what your skin shade is, that only God is just and he will judge the unjust. That is you and that is me. And friends, how do we survive God's justice, his right, perfect justice? 
by repenting of our sin and putting our faith in Christ, the God who left his privilege to make reparation for all of our sin. This is God's justice. And again, this is the gospel. This is the Christian's primary concern. And yes, guys, don't get it twisted. We should fight for real biblical justice as best we can on this planet, in this fallen, broken world. But as we do, please remember this. If someone could somehow right every injustice, past, present, and future, it would not buy you a single drop of blood from Calvary. That would not earn you a single second in heaven. That's done through Christ and the gospel alone, which is biblical justice. At its core, critical social justice, critical race theory gets every core issue wrong. It says, man's identity is found in their group. God's Word says our identity is found as individuals made in God's image. CRT says, no, our problem is oppression. Only some, the oppressors, are guilty. No, God's Word says our problem is sin and all are guilty. Social justice says the solution is a revolution to rebuild back Marxists, if you will. The Bible says the solution is a changed heart through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And humanity is united in these things. United made in God's image, united in our brokenness, united in our need for a Savior. That's why CRT hates Christianity, because CRT wants to divide, collapse, and then rebuild. But we're united in those biblical truths. And actually, tragically, ironically, CRT is utterly impotent against racism. It actually causes it, as we see, as we've seen already. And here's the great news. As Christians, guys, we have the only answer to racism. Did you realize that? The only true answer to racism and racial reconciliation. Guys, only the Bible establishes the equality of all people because we're made in God's image. Only the Bible demands impartial love for all because of that fact that we're made in God's image. Only the Bible tells us where the evil racism came from. Genesis chapter 3 and why it's wrong goes against God's created order that we're made in God's image. And the Bible alone gives us the only cure to racism, which is a changed heart through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because again, racism, racism is not a skin issue. It is a sin issue despite what CRT would tell you. And someone say, okay, but then what about the issues of reparations and the injustices of the past? How do we deal with that? And we should just try to meet the needs of our neighbors, no doubt about that, but please understand as we do, the gospel is the answer to this as well. Because ultimately, everything was paid for at the cross. Everything was paid for. And as Christians, we can and must forgive. Why? Because we have been forgiven. God's word is clear. As a Christian, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. And in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male or female, for all one in Christ Jesus. In the midst of such dynamic division in our culture today, we should be a beacon of unity and reconciliation in the church where we have the truth and the answer to true racial reconciliation found in the gospel and the gospel alone. God's word is sufficient. So to summarize, I think Vody does it well. His book Fault Lines, a fantastic book, by the way. He says, I believe we are being duped by an ideology bent on our demise. This ideology uses, used our guilt and shame of America's past, our love for the brethren, and the good and godly desire for reconciliation and justice as a means through which to introduce destructive heresies. And he goes on to say this, we cannot embrace, modify, or baptize, or Christianize, good word, these ideologies. We must identify, resist, and repudiate them. Let's be sure we're not being taken captive by false ideas built on man's ideas. Let's be sure we're conforming our thoughts to God's word, not man's. Taking everything captive, making it obedient to Christ. And when we do, we got answers, even about racial reconciliation and justice. And we can be the salt and light and the testimony of unity our culture so desperately needs in our world today. God's word is sufficient for everything, including justice. Maybe even especially justice.